the dads once they got out of prison, once they got out of prison, that we needed to um, develop programs and resources for them inside prison um, that would enable them that would enable them to have a successful um, reentry. So that's how we started. So how important is it for these kids? What does it mean to the not only to the person who's in prison, but to the child that all of a sudden gets a connection that maybe they've lost? It's it's um, hugely important. Um, we all probably know the the statistics. Um, you know, incarcerated parents, the kids of incarcerated parents, are three times more likely um, to be um, just as involved um, when their when their parents are incarcerated. We know that when you have an incarcerated parent, um, a lot of the times kids look at it um, worse than a, than a parent's death. You know, when you think about death, there's no coming back from that. But knowing that your dad is you know, just down the road or, you know, just a couple of states over and he's in prison, um, that hurts even more. Um, also, kids um, who have an incarcerated parent, um, they deal with societal issues, self-esteem issues, um, difficult um, academically um, in school. So we believe that by connecting them with their dad, bringing them inside the facility to spend time with their dad, um, helping their dad become a better dad. So when they are out of prison, that they're more present, um, that they do not return to prison, it just creates um, like a new light for these kids. Um, I wish we sent some pictures over. Um, you know, we have dads who have been incarcerated the entire time their children have been alive. Um, we have had we've had dads who have been uh, who are grandparents now. You know, they've missed out on on so much, um, and so by bringing the kids inside the facility, spending time just with their dad, it just kind of creates sort of like a new lifeline in a way, a new a new lifeline for both um, the dad and the kid and also for, for mom as well. So I know your program has expanded, but are you mm-hmm. still doing the dances? And after the dance, is there some way that you can con- continue that connection? Absolutely. So how UESU runs, we are we run on a yearly cohort model. Um, so like currently I'm sitting um, in the lobby at Plainfield Correctional Facility I shared earlier. We have a class at 2.30, I'm mean, at 12.30, another class at 2.30. So how our program runs is like this. So we have three father-child activities that, that we do inside the prison. We do a father-daughter dance. We also do a back-to-school celebration and we also have a Halloween party. And the fathers um, take control of all the activities. They help plan the activities. They decorate for the activities. And the idea behind that is that when the kids come in, we want the dads to be able to say, I I did this. You know, I painted this. It was my idea for this. Um, so the dads have a lot of responsibility um, with that. Um, we also have a fatherhood curriculum that we um, created. It's a 12-week um, curriculum that focuses on just the foundations of fatherhood. Um, all of our dads um, will share with you that they have no idea how to be a dad. Um, many of them grew up without their dad, or they might have strained relationships with their dad. And so we just take it back to the basics, you know, what a father is, which really is um, someone full of mistakes, you know, someone all trying to figure it out. So we really just kind of want to show them that just because they're in prison, dads outside of prison are learning the same thing, making the same mistakes. Um, we also have a therapy program that we just started. It's called Mindful You. All of our dads will wait, go through wait, seven I'm weeks. Sorry. Well, say that again because you you came in Let, and out. Came in and out. Yep. The therapy program is called Mindful You. And it is a seven week group therapy session. And then after the seven weeks, all of our dads um, are connected with their own therapists. And so they will be able to have individual therapy sessions. This is brand new. Um, we just had our first classes last week um, and it's going really, really well. Um, we also work um, one-on-one with our dads on re-entry plans. Um, so we sit down with them and we talk about what their plan is. Um, if they're going to be in Elkhart, we have dads going to Fort Wayne, dads going to Lafayette, dads coming to Indianapolis. We sit down with them and we map out a plan of their re-entry. What do you need? Is it housing? Is it transportation? Is it clothes? Um, if you um, have paternity issues, um, we want to know about all of them. And we sit down with our dads um, and we work together with them, um, with the Indiana Department of Correction, and also a lot of our resources and our partners as well. And we also engage um, heavily with their families. Um, the uniqueness about UESU is that once our dad becomes a UESU dad, I immediately pick up the phone 
and I call mom or I call grandma or I call whomever is um, taking care of their kid and I introduce myself and I let them know um, all about you, Yeshu, what our program is going to be um, for the year. And I also talk with them about our plans to help their loved one with their reentry. And the idea behind that is that we want our families to know that we're here. We want our families to know that we have eyes on their loved one. Um, and we also want our families to know to use us as a resource. Um, it is not easy navigating the jail and prisons and the facilities and court and all of those different things. And so we want our families to know that we are here for the entire family. Um, and we worked really, really hard to build relationships, develop relationships so that when families do have a need that we can adequately help them. I, I want to go back to, you said something about they get a therapist. Um, yes. How does that work? Is a mentor? Are we talking about um, a volunteer, uh, actual therapist? How does that work? No, it's, um, it's an actual therapist. Um, and so we received um, our first state funding. We received a two and a half year um, grant from the FSSA. It's a community catalyst grant um, that allows that allowed us to develop our own um, curriculum. So we developed our own um, mental wellness curriculum. It is something that um, has not been done before within DOC. Um, through our research, I am pretty sure there's not many programs across the country um, that allow for therapy like this inside prisons. Um, and so I developed it with one of my best friends. She's actually a therapist. Um, all of the therapists um, that take part in our program um, either have their license or we're helping them with their hours um, to be able to gain their license. So it's kind of twofold um, to be able to help our dad um, and their therapist. Um, and this is also a way, Nancy, that all of our dads, when they go up for modification, when they go out um, to try to get early release from prison, they all have progress reports um, that is sent to the judges. And so you, yes, you, and mindfully you um, will be in that progress report because we want the judges to know what our dads are working on. We want our judge, we want the judges to know some of the trauma that they dealt with in the past has sort of led them to where they are now. And we really want them to know how hard they're working on trying to heal and learn from that trauma. Um, and so it they're also communicating shows, through through telephone calls or it's in person. It's in person. It, it's in person. All of our therapists. It hasn't been a problem to get into the prisons because that's been an issue. It's been an issue. So this is where God comes in. So we, we're all Christians here and we all know how um, phenomenal um, the God is. I'm not exactly sure why he chose me, um, but I'm grateful that he I did. know, <laughs> <laughs> but I'm grateful that he did. Um, so a Probably in 2019, um, I wanted to develop a, a similar program. And because DOC, they have a healthcare provider. Um, so it was a conflict of interest um, for anyone to come inside um, a prison facility um, and facilitate therapy because it was in their contract uh, for court appointed therapy. Um, so I was able to connect with someone in DOC um, to just ask the question, is it possible that we could do this? Um, and so what they did was their legal team um, took a look at that um, healthcare contract and they only found two red flags that will prevent us uh, from doing therapy. Um, the first red flag was we couldn't call it therapy. So we don't call it therapy, we call it mental wellness. Um, that's an easy fix. Um, and then the second um, red flag was that our therapist cannot diagnose any mental health conditions, which is perfectly fine because we don't want to do that anyway. Um, and so what our therapy program is, we focus specifically on um, the trauma that our fathers have faced, um, specifically the trauma that have led to them making some of the decisions that they've made to wind up in prison. And then we also focused on the anxiety that they feel um, being incarcerated as well as the anxiety um, that they will feel going home to their family and to their community. And so we sort of just, we realize that if we can connect our dads with their kids, provide them with therapy, provide them with resources, engage with their families, that you, yes, you dads are gonna walk out of prison um, on their way to healing um, and have a better, a much better um, uh, line to, to success. And that's what we've experienced with all of our dads. So uh, do you only work through certain prisons? How do you determine where you're, because you're, you're one person. How many people do you have? Um, I am one person. So we're currently at Putnamville Correctional Facility 
and we are also at Plainfield Correctional Facility. Um, we've been approved um, to um, expand to Pendleton Correctional Facility, um, which hopefully we'll be able to do in 2024 um, because I am one person. Um, the three P's, as I kind of call them, they're literally, they're all about an hour, hour and 15 minutes away from my house um, or, for, or from my job. So that enables me um, to be able to get to the facilities um, pretty, pretty easy. Um, I also um, started doing this work full time in January of 2021. Um, prior to, I worked at Simon Property Group. Um, I always joke that about the last three years I was at Simon, they got about 30% of me um, because the 70% of me was working on um, to try to create this. Um, and so our goal um, is that we want to figure out how can we um, be impactful? How can we um, touch all fathers, even if we can't be there? What are the ways that you, yes, you um, can be impactful, even if we aren't able to be there? Um, and so one of those solutions is all of the dads, well, all, all individuals, when they're incarcerated, when they come to prison, they receive a tablet. Um, and so we're working on creating a UESU app on the tablet, which where we'll have all of our um, fatherhood curriculum, we'll have our Mindfully You um, workbook on there. Um, some of the books that, that we've read that we're going to read will be um, on there. Um, we will also put all of our resources that we've gained over the years on there. So even if we can't physically be there, we want to be able to have some sort of impact on all fathers um, throughout Indiana. So what if some of the people around the state that will, even if they're not here today, they'll be able to see this video. What if they wanted to replicate what you do in their part of the state? How, is that possible? Would you be okay with that? How would it work? Yeah, it's it's absolutely possible. We we've, um, we've actually... Um, been very strategic of how we built UESU. One of the things about working in prison facilities is that what it looks like at one prison facility, the program has to look like that exactly at the next facility. So that means that replication is pretty easy. Um, our fatherhood curriculum, our, um, our therapy curriculum, our um, curriculums that we've created, so we own the rights to those. Um, and so it's very... Um, I don't say easy um, to replicate. So I don't want to throw that out there, but it's absolutely a possibility that if there's someone that's in um, a county that's very far from Indianapolis that I might not ever be able to get to, um, we would love um, to have a conversation um, to be to to talk about replication. Um, I would love the opportunity to do that whenever that happens. Yeah. Um, I, is there any? Can we open this to questions at this point? Is anyone? have some thoughts or questions? Yes. I just think it's amazing work. I mean, if, if all of our Indiana State prisons had UESU in it, there'd be a lot less recidivism and just amazing. Thank you. Sarah. I have a couple uh, questions. Um, Erica, wow, what a tremendous program. And Thank kudos you. to you for following God's will and nudge. Maybe it wasn't even a nudge. No. <laughs> um, do you partner with other nonprofit organizations in the city? I see on your website that you uh, partner with United Way, but I'm, I'm wondering if there are other organizations that you work with. That's my first question. Absolutely. Um, partnership and collaboration is how we how we do this work. Um, you know, it's, it, it really does um, take a village. And so we absolutely partner um, with a lot of organizations, nonprofits, businesses that are in our city. Um, what you saw on our website, our partners, um, our funding partners um, um, that have been amazing to us is the reason that we're here. Um, and so they're on our website um, to let people know um, sort of the diverse um, funding partners that we do have. But yes, we absolutely partner with nonprofits. Great. Um, and my second question is related to outcomes. Um, and I know that you are, uh, you know, such a young organization, but if you have any outcomes, what are they? And if you don't yet have the outcomes, to what do you aspire? Absolutely. Great question. Um, we absolutely have outcomes. And so we um, started to track those outcomes um, in 2018 um, when we came to Putnamville Correctional Facility. So all of our data, um, even though 
we started our first dance in 2014 and we became a nonprofit in 2015. From 2014 to 2018, um, God and I were just trying to figure this thing out together. Um, and so since 2018, we've had 72 fathers um, released from prison. We've only had two fathers um, return to prison. One of those dads um, was released four weeks ago. Um, him and I were actually on the phone on my way to this facility today. Um, and then the other father um, that returned to prison, he's actually at Putnamville um, Correctional Facility with me um, again. Um, and I always put the caveat out there about these two dads is that they both were released during COVID. Um, and uh, the first dad, his name is John, who was released um, four weeks ago. I can pretty promise that he won't go back to prison. Um, and that is simply just because of the support um, the way we've been able to grow since 2020, we have a lot more resources that we're able to help him um, out with. Um, then our second dad, um, he has two additional years to do um, at Putnamville. Um, his name is Andre. Andre is someone who has um, mental health issues and they have never been addressed, ever, ever, ever. And so I'm intrigued to see um, what will happen if Andre is um, receives the mental health services that he deserves to receive, that he should have received um, while he's incarcerated at Putnamville. Um, and we have a partnership with DOC. So we're not a, um, a volunteer organization with DOC. Uh, we're an, a program. Uh, we actually have a four-year contract with them. Um, and so that enabled us to sort of have a small say-so um, when Andre was um, uh, sent back to prison where he would go. And I wanted him at Putnamville so that he could take part in our program um, and so that I can sort of see firsthand um, that he gets the services um, that he needs um, because he has four kids um, that um, desperately depend upon him. Um, also, uh, this year we have 18 dads taking part of our program at Putnamville. And we have 31 dads here um, at Plainfield um, that's taking uh, part in our program. And we have a wait list at both facilities. We have about 150 applications at Putnamville, and we have about 75 applications here um, at Plainfield um, for our program. I'd just like to add from my own experience that the fact that you're involved with the dad and the, and the mother is not, the kids are not, when you call them, and they know you're involved, all of a sudden, they will open the door. And not maybe everyone, maybe some really bad things have happened between them, and maybe that's always going to be close. But that is a huge thing. That telephone call you make is incredible. The personal touch, and I, I really can see this going all around the state. And with your leadership and your experience, I think this would make a huge difference. And I'll tell you why. I, I, I see it making a big difference because we've got to have these kids grow up, not identifying as someone who now they're going to go to prison or they're going to be in jail over and over and over again. Um, we have got to think of the children in this. And, and I, I think your program is so great from that standpoint. Thank you, Nancy. And you actually, um, I'm glad that you brought that up because somehow we'll figure somehow we'll figure out how to do this better but I know that when people think of you yes you um they only think about dads um that our work is for dads and it is but ultimately our goal is the kids you know our mission is to help build relationships between incarcerated dads and their kids and strengthen their ability to be fathers because we want them to be present and active for their kids and so I always tell people that it wasn't that my dad I didn't grow up with my dad um, and I realized as I got older that it wasn't that my dad um, wasn't a good dad. He just didn't know how to do it. And because he didn't know how to be a good dad, um, his reaction was just to run away, was just to go away. So what would happen if someone showed up in front of my dad um, and helped him with resources and show him empathy? Um, would he have felt like he could have done the job, you know? Um, and so ultimately that would have helped me also, and so, you know, you, yes, you, our ultimate goal um, is for our dads to get out of prison um, and to have already made this connection with their kids and not want to lose that connection and so um, that they don't go back to prison. And that's sort of the results that we've been able to see. Susie, didn't you have a question? Yes, uh, I, I was going to ask about the, the um, outcomes as well. But secondly, are you aware of 
Mary Getze's program in Bloomington called, I think it's kids, um, kids with incarcerated, no, that doesn't fit. Anyway, whatever it is, Mary Getze at Indiana University um, has had a program for five years or so where they uh, meet bi-monthly with children of incarcerated parents and they meet then separately at the same time with the um, mothers or I don't know whether they have any fathers or not. But anyway, uh, it's it's been a, an excellent program and they they also do the um, have the fathers or mothers uh, record uh, books uh, that they give to the the children and so on. But uh, anyway, if you you don't have that connection, would you would you put your uh, contact information in the chat so that I could pass that along? Absolutely, thank you. Uh oh, sorry about Is that. Is that read to me? Is that called read to me? I'm not sure. That's um, I believe that's the name of that program. I'm pretty sure. Uh, Phyllis, uh, thank you for joining us. Do, do you have any questions for Erica? Well, I would because I go into uh, a, a women's prison. I was wondering uh, if this could be extended uh, with women because they are also um, away from their children, and many of them don't have any parenting skills. Yes, and so you, yes, you um, actually came from the need for just dads. Um, I know that there are um, several programs. Um, there's so here. So here's a statistic that I normally I normally give out, um, and the numbers change every year or every month. But there's approximately twenty one thousand people incarcerated in Indiana, and about yes. fifteen hundred of them are women, and so that means we're looking at about over eighteen thousand. Are men, and of those eighteen thousand men, two thirds, or about sixty five percent, are dads. And there are twenty seven um, adult prison facilities in Indiana, and there uh, twenty four of them are for men. And so within those three facilities for women, there are multiple programs um, um, to assist mom um, to be great moms. There are programs where mom can bring their kids inside, and they can. Um, uh, breastfeed their kids. They can, you know, be engaged with their kids. Um, and UESU is the only program in Indiana and DLC that focuses on dads like we do. And so the reason that we we do not um, engage with moms is because there are already programs that are out there that are inside the facilities that engage with mom. Um, but there aren't any besides us um, that engage um, with dads like we do. I have a I have a question, Erica. You said that you have these waiting lists. What is is there a limit on how many people you can get together? What's what's the story on that? Sure. And so our max is thirty dads. Okay. To take to take part in the program. Um, is that yes. Decided by the by DOC. Um, DOC and and myself. This our this our personal capability. Um. Because even though you ha we have 30 dads on average, our dads have about three kids. And so if you multiply that, if, and, and all of our dads will not take part in the activities um, that we do. Um, some of that is just because of relationships have a lot more work to do before mom says yes. Um, sometimes mom lives too far. Um, transportation um, is, a huge, is a huge issue. So if we have 30 dads at Plainfield, probably half of them probably about 15, 16 of them will probably take part in our activities. Um, and then the other dads are still putting in the work and they're still they're still doing all of the things. Um, it's just that they might have a little bit more work to do um, for their kids to take part in the activities. Um, but the 30 is um, the max for space purposes, staff purposes, um, and then our capability to make sure that we can engage successfully, effectively with our dads. I won't be able to do that with like 50. If they had a How time. do you determine who gets in? Yes, so we have an application process. Um, all of our dads uh, fill out an application. Um, the criteria um, deals with conduct, um, and it also deals with um, your ability to be able to attend all of our classes. 
Um, and so all of the dads, in order to stay, um, stay in our program, um, they can't have any kind of write-ups uh, as well. And so that just helps them um, to be more disciplined. Yeah. Um, and it really, it really, um, and it helps the facility out too, you know, our dads, and we don't really worry about conduct anymore. Um, one, our dads really don't want to hear my mouth about it. So if they get in trouble, they're going to hear me. Um, and so I know they don't want to do that. Yeah. And then once we make contact with family and we make contact with kids, um, they don't want to mess up that opportunity um, as well. So part of that, but making that phone a- call. A room full of directed, caring people who want to improve and want to have contact with their kids. I mean, so everybody's on the yes. same page, right? We're all okay. yeah, we're all on the same page, and we are not a time cut program. Um, so all of the dads who are in our program, they want to be um, in our program, and so it just it just makes it even more fulfilling that way. Anybody else? Is there any way that we can? Uh, have some kind of uh, uh, brochures or identification things uh, at the table at the conference. Oh, yeah. Uh, Erica, we have a a conference. (laughs) United Methodist Church has an annual conference, and we usually have a table for the prison and jail committee. Um, and that's what she's asking about. Is, is there anything you could give away that is yours that maybe you could get to Lori and uh, she could have there? Absolutely. We just did a whole rebranding. Um, and so we have all, all of that that you need. So I can send you over a one pager and some, and some other information um, card. I can mail some to you as well um, so that you can have for that too. Yep. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Phyllis, for mentioning that. That was very important. Thank you. Very good. Oh, you're welcome. I think it would be great. Thank you. So, Erica, did we miss anything? Have we not asked you all the right questions? I I haven't got mine yet. Oh, Oh. Russ, Russ, you have a question? Okay. Coming from the law enforcement side of it, Mm -hmm. being from the inside looking out, um, can you just briefly go through the application process? of what the rules are, because you have to realize from a father's standpoint, there's going to be fathers that have restraining orders, Mm -hmm. uh, no content Mm -hmm. and all that information. Mm -hmm. Also, um, you were talking about as you build your uh, organization up, I don't know if you're familiar with Dave's Killer Bread that's on door shelves. I'm sorry, with Dave's? Dave's Killer Bread. It's the name of the brand of the bread. He only hires incarcerated individuals that have been released with his bread company um, because he himself was incarcerated. So it's a way for him to give back to the community and for him to build the self-esteem of the inmates. So has there been any process or thought through that for your organization of using those that have used your system while being incarcerated to come through that? So. No, and thank you for that. And that's one of the reasons why I love doing Zooms like this and I love meeting people because I this is how I I learn about all of the programs, the individuals um, who do hire um, formerly incarcerated people or who understand um, formerly incarcerated people. So I would love that information. Um, and to your first question, yes, yeah, so our dads, none of the dads in our program um, have any, um, but there's no sex offenders. Um, in our program, and none of our dads can have crimes against children or crimes against their children. And so, um, once the applica- once our our dads um, complete the application process, um, there's a case manager at each facility that's assigned to our program, and they mm-hmm. go through the background check and all the security checks and check the charges um, to make sure um, that none of the dads in our program uh, have any crimes against children. Um, just um, we're an organization where we want to give everybody an opportunity. Um, we believe that everybody deserves deserves a shot, um, but we do recognize um, there's a safety um, safety component, um, and especially because we are around children, that is specifically the reason why we do not we do not allow that. That was a great question. You're muted, Nancy. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry, I keep trying to not have feedback. Um, Erica, I, 
I hope you know that in the nine county area, we have uh, 41 employers who are on listed on our uh, secondchanceindy.com website and they can people can apply online and uh, the people that are listing their jobs absolutely know that they have a record so they're not knocking on doors and having them slammed in their faces um, it's an option for that I know that doesn't cover the whole state but it's available in the central area no it's, it's perfect and I have and I have looked at it so it's it's fantastic <laughs> oh good I'm glad um, yes. is there anybody else that has a question if not, we should let this busy lady go. But Lori, have you got any final words? Uh, our next uh, network Zooming, Zoom call is going to be uh, June 20th. And uh, we're going to have people share about um, uh, their work in uh, the county jails. And Russ is going to be one of the presenters and Rhonda Churchill, or Upchurch, rather, Rhonda Upchurch. And uh, we're, we're looking forward to uh, hearing more about how we can work into the people, we can share a resource on how people can get engaged in the county jails. Excellent. I just wanted to thank everybody again um, for the opportunity um, just to come listen to you, Yeshu, um, and for your questions. And that if, if I can be of help in any way, any possible way, whether it's with a resource or any help, how to navigate, um, a lot of the times I know that volunteers um, who are not in the prison system um, need a, a way to get in. So I hear it's, sometimes it's not easy um, to figure out how to navigate DOC and to volunteer. So if I can be of help that way, I'd be more than happy. Um, so anything that I could do to help anyone, please let me know. Erica, thank you for your time and thank your you. wisdom. Yeah, wow. outstanding, outstanding presenter, Erica. We're so impressed with you. Thanks, Lori. I appreciate you. you. We send you all of our prayers and blessings for your work and just your heart. What a gift. Thank you. Thank you. I'll share the well wishes with our dads. I'm going to go see them now, so I'll let them all know that. <laughs> and this is I, I, this is going to be recorded, so other people uh, who weren't able to come on the call today, hopefully we'll have a chance to uh, hear the recording. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank appreciate, you. Appreciate your being here today.